Hey everyone, we're so glad to be joining with you all today here online as we pick back up in our series, Do You Hear What I Hear? Because of Cantata last weekend, we'll be celebrating communion today. So I wanna invite you all to grab those supplies as we get started so we can all be a part of that later in the service. And as always, we have our team here to answer any questions you have and to pray with you this morning. So be sure to let us know how we can help or how to best pray for you anytime during the service. As we gather this morning, I believe that God has things for you and that he has things for me. We're not here to leave unchanged. And I hope that what we encounter in the moments ahead with God and with his people changes things for us. And it's gonna take us leaning in together this morning for that to happen. So as we sing and give and continue in Matthew and pray, let's participate in what God wants to do in and through us. Get ready for that as we head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Good morning, Christ Chapel. My name is Shamira, and I have the honor and privilege of serving on our student ministry team. Whether you are joining us in the sanctuary or online, we are in for an incredible hour of worship this morning. If this is your first time here to Christ Chapel, welcome. In the seat back in front of you is what we call our Connect card. We ask that you fill that out with as much information as you feel comfortable with, and you can drop that off in any of the offering boxes as we are leaving services this morning, and someone from our Christ Chapel staff will get in contact with you this week and tell you a little bit more about our Christ Chapel family. Also on our Connect card, it's a place for you to write your prayer request. We believe in the power of prayer here at Christ Chapel, and it would be our honor to pray for you guys this week. You can write your prayer request on the Connect card as well and submit that by dropping them off in the offering boxes, and our staff, leadership team, and prayer team will be praying for you guys throughout the week. Well, if you're like myself in the hustle and bustle of the holiday season, life can get very hectic and crazy. And we want to put two things on your radar as you're looking forward to celebrating the Christmas season. First, on Saturday, December 24th, we will have our Christmas Eve services all across our three campuses as well as online. These are contemporary as well as traditional services. And this is a great opportunity for you to invite your friends, your family, and your neighbors to come and hear about the love of Jesus Christ. For more information on our service times, you can check out our Christ Chapel website as well as submit your reservation reminders. And there are also some inviter cards out in the great room as you're exiting the services this morning that you can grab and hand out to people as you see them throughout your week. Then on Sunday, December the 25th, Christ Chapel is going home with you for the holidays. We have created a unique service for you to watch and share with people in your world and in your sphere of influence. This will include as devotional times from our campus pastors as well as some of your favorite renditions of your holiday songs. This is our gift to you guys here at Christ Chapel, and Cody will tell you more on how you can unpack that and receive it well at the end of his sermon this morning. Christ Chapel family, I am so excited to worship with you this morning, but before we do that, how about we stand and say hello to those around us? I haven't seen him out. Let's sing together. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and be holy, born the King of Heaven. 
What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap? Let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels Taste, taste to bring him love, the babe, the son of man. Sing together. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of light. Angels lifting praise before you, sing throughout this holy night. In a manger lies a baby, child of Mary, son of God. Voices join in joyful chorus, praise you for your gift of love. All your works declare your glory, all creation joins to sing. Praise resounds as earth rejoices in the birth of Christ. The King, shepherds kneel before the end, trumpets sound and anthems raise. As with joy our hearts are lifted, join in wonder, love, and praise. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. We're uh, starting a time, or we're entering in a time of uh, worship through giving. Uh, if you're a guest here, we just want to say thank you for coming, and we want you to receive this worship service as just our gift to you. If you are a regular tender here and you'd like to, uh, like to give to this ministry, there are several ways you can do it. There's a, uh, you can do it online, you can text, there's a text to, to give, and there's also you can give out in the great room as well. Here at the end of the year, we um, often have a end of the year giving, and that's also true as well. If you'd like to consider giving something extra towards the end of the year, you can find out about that online. But there's several uh, things I could just mention about that. Our, in some of our campuses, at least, our kids program are just expanding greatly, and we need to add some facilities to, to help with our kids program for that next generation. So that's one of the things we're doing. We also have some campuses, actually new campuses, that are coming online perhaps, out in Granbury, we have a group that's been meeting. They've grown to a point they need facility and they need equipment, so that might be going towards that. And something closer to my own heart, uh, we sponsor a theological education all around the world, including India and Africa and Latin America, and some of our end-of-year giving will go towards that as well. Just to let you know, but consider that, um, and let's just give all our praise to the Lord. Let me pray for our offertory. Father, um, you are the giver of good gifts in everything. We thank you for this season where that's just reminded uh, to us. We know that we can give back to you just in a spirit of worship and trust. And so we ask that you would let our hearts just be joyful givers because you gave us everything we have. It's in your son's name, Christ, that we pray. Amen.
Chapel and Merry Christmas. I was, doesn't the choir and orchestra, they do such a fantastic job, don't they? Yeah. They did a great job with the cantata. I hope you're able to come to that. I was just joking with Josh. I said, 
part of end of year giving can go to buy another piano so those poor ladies don't have to share <laughs> if, we, if we need to. But uh, no, Jennifer and Kathy did a great job uh, on that. So uh, if you're joining us online, special welcome to you. Thank you for choosing to uh, spend a part of your weekend with us. Uh, at the first service, that, that first sermon that, that I preach in the nine o'clock service goes out to uh, the other campuses at the West Campus and South Campus. And I took a moment to stop there this morning because I realized uh, some of the folks that just come to the Fort Worth campus don't really have a, a perspective of what goes on at those other campuses campuses, so I'd like to do the same uh, with you, because at those other campuses, there are hundreds of men, women, children that meet there on a weekly basis, and those particular campuses have their own specific campus pastors, and the role of those campus pastors over those particular campuses is to help care for those folks, uh, to walk with them through the ups and downs of life, but also to equip and encourage them to fulfill our vision, be one, make one, reach one, be disciples, make disciples, reach those who do not yet know or walk with Jesus, and then also to contextualize those initiatives for those communities. If those communities have particular needs, then they can step into those because they live with these folks all the time in that area. So that's the role of those campus pastors. So you might not know who they are, so I wanted to introduce you to them. Uh, at the West Campus, we have Matt Lance. So there's Matt and Darcy and their three kiddos. Matt took over the West Campus lead role when I left. I used to be the West Campus pastor, and so he took over there whenever I left. And then at the South Campus, we have Micah Barnum. So there's Micah and Holly and their four kids. Micah and Holly have been here for over two decades. He's been in different roles here, but then uh, took over at the South Campus when that opened up. So logically, in your mind, you should be asking, who's the Fort Worth campus pastor? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know how to take that, but, um, but I appreciate it because, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Some of you might say, well, Cody, of course, you are the Fort Worth campus pastor, but I cannot be the Fort Worth campus pastor and the lead pastor for a multi-site church overseeing all those things at all the other campuses. And the good thing is we have a biblical model, biblical models in the Old Testament and the New Testament of God em employing people to help care for his people. And my heart is that you guys would get the care that you want, that the, the care for you and through the ups and downs of your life wouldn't be bottlenecked at just me. So back in 2019, I began talking with our leadership about employing a Fort Worth campus pastor, somebody that could do what uh, Jethro told Mo Moses. He needed to get the care to the people in Exodus 18 or in Acts chapter 6, uh, where the elders employed the deacons so that they could help care for the people. And so we began to pray about that, about who could fulfill those needs. It's a tall task, because if you think about the Fort Worth campus, I mean, there are thousands of people who come here every weekend, including the children. So this person has to have experience leading a large staff, certainly has to have our Christ Chapel DNA, has to be able to connect with multiple different generations, multi-generational connection, and has to be able to help in the pulpit from time to time uh, too. So we began to pray about that in 2019 and uh, the choice just became super obvious and clear. And our elders unanimously chose to make Ben Fuquay our Fort Worth campus pastor. So yeah. So there's Ben and Danielle and uh, Charlie and Miles, and uh, you'll get to hear from Ben next week. The reason why he's not here is because Ben is still, uh, he's preaching over at college, because that's something I want to make very clear. Ben is not leaving college and young adults. He's just taking on the Fort Worth campus. So he's still going to participate in and provide directional leadership for the college and young adult ministries that are here in Fort Worth, that are part of the Fort Worth campus. But he's going to take on your care as well for, for you as you attend the Fort Worth campus. And this, again, really is that 
My heart is that, that you're cared for. We have to continue to make the big church feel small. You need care and you need relationships. And I don't want to be, I don't want to inhibit that in, in any way. And I need to also be able to build relationships at the other campuses with those folks as well. And so uh, that's why Ben is coming on and going to be a great help. Now, one of your questions might be, okay, Cody, if Ben is coming on as a Fort Worth campus pastor, then what are you going to do? We thought you only worked one day a week anyway, and now you have help with that. Well, uh, as much as I can, I still obviously want to help pastor you as much as possible, and I'll continue to partner with those uh, campus pastors at the particular campuses, uh, but I'm still going to be working with uh, the elders on uh, the direction and the strategic leadership for the future of our church. I'll still continue to communicate uh, the messaging so that we have a consistent message and a consistent methodology for how we do ministry in our particular uh, context, and then I'll also obviously continue to preach and guide the teaching from the pulpit. So uh, I am not going anywhere. You just get the addition of of a very gifted man who is called and loves you tremendously. So I am super excited about it. Ben is super excited about it. He's preaching next week, so you'll be able to express your appreciation to him, but it's my turn to preach this week. So will you open your Bibles to Matthew 27, please? Matthew chapter 27. Uh, it's page 834. If you're opening one of those blue Bibles... And uh, it's Matthew 27, we're going to begin at verse 15, and we're obviously continuing our series, uh, Do You Hear What I Hear? But this is really a mini-series as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew, and this is actually the second to last sermon in our study on Matthew that we've been in for an entire year. So yes, we're going to speed through the end here. Uh, we're going to skip over the crucifixion. Just so you know, it's really hard to do the crucifixion when you're celebrating baby Jesus. And so we'll kind of skip over that. But uh, you know that story happens anyway. Uh, but uh, just so you know, since we're coming to the end of the year and coming to the end of this study, I want you to know where we're headed in the next year. J beginning January 8th, we're going to keep the story going and we're going to spend a year in the book of Acts. So I'm really excited about that, looking at how the, the church grew as they reached those in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, how they reached those in their own backyard to spread the good news of Jesus so we can take on those same lessons so that we can hopefully reach those in our own backyard as well. So really excited. Uh, 2023 is going to be a great year for our church. I'm really, really excited about it. But before we get to 2023, let's talk about what is on everyone's mind right now, and that is gifts. Everybody is thinking about gifts right now. Uh, maybe you have uh, gifts that you want, or maybe you're thinking about the gifts that you got to give because it's coming up on crunch time here where you don't have a whole lot of time to order something and get it here in time. And, and this is all based on these customary gift exchanges that we do during this time of the year. Some of those are explicit. Like you, you say, hey, we're going to get you a gift, and that exchange happens, or maybe you're a part of a work thing. Some of it are implicit, though, where people just expect that you're going to get them a gift this year. And so the, the, that exchange has, has to happen. But one of the things that we don't like to think about or talk about when it comes to gift exchanges is that oftentimes there's a double exchange. What I mean by that is you exchange gifts with somebody and the gift that you give them that you put thought into, time, finances, maybe even prayer. They say, I want something else. And they take it and they exchange it for something that is different. Maybe a different size, different color, maybe something like that, or maybe something different altogether. And if they really want to twist the knife, it's just a gift card so that they can get something else. That's how much they disliked your gift that, they, that you gave them. And we don't like to talk about those things. And the truth is, though, all those same thoughts run through our own heads, 
When we unwrap a present, we think, is this really what I wanted? Maybe I could get something else. And so every gift exchange turns into this white elephant gift exchange. You know what those are, where whatever you open is not necessarily what you end up with. You always keep an eye on something else that you can maybe steal later on. So it really just puts you in the spirit of coveting what other people have. Um, You know, it's just... Christmas spirit we all need these days, you know? So that's the gift exchange that everybody has, and that's the mindset that everybody is in, is really honestly thinking about exchanging what we get for what we want. Sometimes we don't always get what we want, and during this season of wishing and wanting, uh, that doesn't stop with these material gifts, I think during this time, we also get time to reflect, and some people begin to reflect upon thinking uh, that they would like to trade what they have now for what they wish could be. That could be in a relationship that you wish changed. That, that could be in a career that you go to that office party and you go, I don't even like these people. What? I wish I had a different, I I don't want the job I had now. I wish I could change. It's the home. As you begin to decorate for Christmas and you go, gosh, you know, if we just, I I could have a different home, a a bigger kitchen, a better place for a Christmas tree that you put up for a month. But you think about those things. We want to exchange what we have for what we wish could be. And really, that just points at our discontentment in our own hearts. We're discontent with what God has given us and discontent with what we have. And the real question we need to ask as we consider exchanging gifts or exchanging all those things that I just mentioned is, is it worth an exchange? And that's what we're going to talk about today from the Gospel of Matthew because we're going to look at an infamous exchange, probably the most infamous exchange throughout all history that is actually recorded here in Scripture. So I want to explain what that exchange was, and then I want to give you some introspective questions because I think those, they, these questions are going to help you as you reflect this season on uh, some possible exchanges you may be considering, and then I'll give you an application at the end. So let's look. Uh, we're going to begin, as I told you, in verse 15. And what I want you to see here is that a customary exchange back then, even in Scripture, presents a great opportunity. It's going to present a great opportunity. And let me give you the context before we jump into that real fast. Remember, uh, Ted preached a couple weeks ago. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in the press. Wonderful sermon. Did a fantastic job with that. Uh, We are fast forwarding now. Jesus has been arrested. Uh, He's taken by the religious leaders, put on trial with the high priest. They think he's blasphemous and they want him killed. The Jews, however, the religious leaders, don't have the authority to kill anyone. So they hand him over to the Roman government so that they can kill him because they have the authority of the sword. They can kill and crucify people. So the religious leaders put him on trial in front of Pilate. Now, Pilate is going to be in quite the pickle here because Pilate doesn't think Jesus deserves to die. That's where we get into this customary exchange that presents an opportunity. So look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Stop right there. So I want to explain some of those things. The feast that they're talking about is the, the Passover feast. And what's important to understand is so many nuances of the Passover feast, but what's important for this sermon to understand is that this was a feast that Jews from all over Israel, all over, pilgrimed to Jerusalem for. So there are thousands of extra people in the city at this time, particularly Jews who do not like Rome. They don't like Rome and they don't like Pilate. And Pilate is the governor who is mentioned here, or another word for it is procreator. Uh, 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 
No, that's not what I mean, not procreator. Um, <laughs> what word am I thinking of there? Do you know what I'm talking about? Procouncil. Um, procurator, not procreator. <laughs> procurator was the word I was thinking of, but thank you, Bill. I need help, guys. <laughs> This is why we need a Fort Worth campus pastor, okay? So thank God for Ben. I'm glad he's coming. So Pilate is there, and really the only reason he's installed in this particular role uh, as the procurator is because he's supposed to keep the peace. That, that's all. Keep the peace amongst the people. That's his one job description. And peace is not being kept at this point They are not keeping the peace because now he's got this group that wants this particular person crucified, and they are adamant about that happening, but he doesn't want it to happen. And so what he does is he leans on this custom that he had come up with with the Jews that during this time, he would release one of their prisoners. Now, the only reason why it was a custom was because he made it a custom during that time to release a prisoner that was their own to appease them so that they would, it was an act of goodwill so they would have a good relationship so that he could keep the peace. Now, he doesn't want to kill Jesus. He wants them to choose to take Jesus back. So the way that he thinks he's going to get them to do this is by offering Barabbas. Now, the, the reason why he offers them this choice, you get Jesus or Barabbas, is because Barabbas is an infamous criminal. He is, he's a murderer, And when I say infamous, meaning he is well known amongst all the Jews that this is a bad dude. This isn't a guy you want walking around the streets. It's not a guy you want in society. He wants them to choose Jesus and go, oh, of course. No, we wouldn't want Barabbas. Uh, We'll take Jesus back. And then Jesus is off Pilate's hands. He's, he's infamous. They know this is a bad, this is like uh, today if we said, hey, do you want Jesus or Charles Manson? Wh- which one do you want? That, that's the choice that he is offering them this day and gives them an opportunity to choose Jesus. And that's why I say it's an opportunity here. Because everything that the, the religious leaders have done up to this point to crucify Jesus, this is like the final chance that they get to go, you know what, we're wrong. We've been wrong about this this Jesus guy. You know what, we'll take him back. We'll take him off your hands, Pilate. Don't crucify him. But instead, they go the opposite way. And why? The text tells us right there why. Because Pilate knew they were envious of him. The religious leaders were envious of Jesus. Now, what are they envious of? They're envious of his power. He has, he has sway. He has power over the people. And they weren't going to, the religious leaders weren't going to have that prestige that the people had given him, nor were they going to be able to do whatever they wanted to do any longer. Because if you remember all the way back to the first series that we did, or the second one that we did, this, Jesus turned everything upside down uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. This is different than anything the religious leaders were teaching. So now they have to change the way they're living if they take him back. You see, I'm going to pause right here because when we consider this account, none of us consider that we would be a part of the crowd that's saying, crucify Jesus. None of us think we would do that. But all of us do it on a daily basis because we say, I'd rather have it my own way So I'll exchange Jesus for my own way because I like doing what I say. I don't want to do what he says. I don't want to have to change my life. So I'll exchange him for, for me. I'll exchange his kingship for my own rule and my own reign. You see, in this season of wishing and wanting, I want you to consider some of these introspective questions. And the first one is, I'm going to pause, is right here. And it's this, assess why you want what you want. Assess why you want what you want. I think it's really important 
to assess that because you've got to be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Maybe there are wrong motives in what you're asking for and the reason why you're asking for things. The motives, obviously, that the religious leaders had, they weren't pure motives. They, it was out of envy. It, that's why it doesn't turn out well for them. They didn't start off in a good place. They didn't evaluate, why do I want this? Maybe it's a good thing if Jesus is king. No, he just got in their way. See, we've got to assess why we want what we want. And I always like going back to a passage. Uh, it's in James chapter 4, verse 1, when we think about these motives. And James asks his readers, he says, uh, what is it that causes quarrels and strifes among you? Is it not your own selfish desires that war within you? Like, it, it, that's what puts you in conflict with everybody else. It's it's what's going on inside you. It's the envy that you have. And we are willing to trade those relationships, whether it's Jesus or someone else, for our own way. And so maybe one of the first things we have to do in the season of wishing and wanting is just step back and assess why we want what we want. Because your wants will be tested. Your wants will be tested. If you keep going in verse 20 and 21, you're going to see an opportunity to exchange was accompanied with peer pressure. An opportunity to exchange was accompanied with peer pressure. Look at verse 20. It says, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Which is funny because he keeps asking them the same question. Like, please have a different answer. And they said, Barabbas. You can sense as you read through this passage, you can sense the mob mentality. It continues to grow. The, The momentum of we want Barabbas, we don't want Jesus continuing to go. The the religious leaders are whipping them up into a frenzy, this crowd. Remember, this is why I mentioned the the Passover feast. There are more Jews who do not like the Roman government, specifically they don't like Pilate, who are gathering, who are saying, this is what we want. Do this, do this. You can feel the peer pressure begin uh, to, to mount for him, but he's not only having external pressure, he's got internal pressure as well. Because internally, as I told you at first, he doesn't want to kill Jesus. He knows that Jesus is an innocent man. In fact, four times throughout the Gospels, he says in these passages and even in the synoptics, he says, there's nothing wrong. There's no reason to kill you. He, he is fighting his own conscience So he's got external pressure from the crowd. He's got internal pressure from his own conscience. And then, if that's not enough, he has marital pressure. If you look back at verse 19, this isn't on your sermon notes. It says in verse 19, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. She knows, don't kill him. Back off. Dude, listen to your wife. You, you, don't, you don't need to go there. So you see, you see all these pressures beginning to mount on Pilate. And he doesn't know what to do. Because what do you do when everybody wants you to do something different? Puts you in a hard place. Leads us to our second introspective question. Assess who wants you to want what you want. Who wants you to want what you want? Who wants you to want that? Does God want you to want that? Is that you? Is it somebody else? Where is this desire coming from? Because essentially all Pilate is doing here is playing politics. He's just trying to please the most amount of people that he can. And as you've heard the saying before, try to please everyone and you please no one. That's what, that's what happens right here with Pilate. One commentator called this section, and I love this line, the plight 
of an unprincipled man. I love that because Pilate doesn't have principles. All he has is politics. It's please these people and please these people. Do enough to please that person. Do enough to please them. And maybe I can skate by. Maybe I can get by if I just please enough people. And we talk with our boys about this. We talk about this in our family all the time of being people of conviction. This is my conviction and I know who I am and I know who God has called me to be. Therefore, this is how I behave. This is how I act. Being people of conviction, not being swayed because this person says this or that person says that. Who wants you to want what you want? Sometimes tracing those things back to the source. Maybe you go, it's not me. I I have good, maybe it's somebody else that wants you to, that's putting that pressure on you to want something uh, that may not be of God. And this who question is important to understand, because when you start talking about pleasing people, you can cross a line where you're trading Jesus for popularity, where you're going, I I fear people more than I fear God. I'm doing this to appease people. And honestly, folks, sometimes there are people in this world who just want a partner in crime. And there's no reason to assuage their desires and destroy your life just because they don't want to be the only one going down. That that doesn't make any sense. And so don't trade Jesus for this popularity. Don't trade Jesus just to please one one person. Uh, Make sure we're pleasing him and pleasing God because the choice to exchange will have individual consequences. The choice to exchange will have individual consequences. If you look at verse 24 to 26, it says, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, what does that mean he's gaining nothing? That the crowd is not doing what he wants them to do, which is either calm down or take Jesus off my hands. He'll take either. But they're not doing either, so he's gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning. So he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So he realizes I'm not going to be able to please all these people and appease my wife and appease my conscience. And so he, he, he tries to do all things. So he, he, gives, he gives a Barabbas back over to the people so that calms them down. But then he does something else that I think is a way to try to appease his own conscience and his wife. He washes his hands. This, that's where you get the phrase where I'm going to have nothing to do with this any longer. So he washes his hands of Jesus and says, I am innocent, which is wonderful to say, but just saying you're innocent doesn't make you innocent, right? I don't know how many of you watch The Office. Uh, It's an old show. I love The Office. And there's a scene in there, uh, I can't remember what season it is, but where Jan is running up Michael's and maxing out all of Michael's credit cards and he's having a hard financial time, and he doesn't know what to do, so he steps out of his office, and he says, I declare bankruptcy. And Oscar, the accountant, comes by and goes, I don't think it works that way. You know, you don't just get to say it, and then it happens. Same way with Pilate here. You don't just get to say, I am innocent. Oh, whoa, he said it. Guess he's innocent. But just because he does that doesn't mean that he is and so that's, you, you've got to understand that, that there are consequences for these exchanges. Some of those are welcomed and some of those are unwelcomed. The welcomed ones, the people say, let his blood be on our head and on our head. We'll welcome those consequences. And obviously, that's short-sighted and foolish. Uh, but Pilate tries to distance himself from the consequences and say, no, I don't, I don't want those. 
It doesn't matter if you want those. You still made the exchange, and you're going to have to live with those consequences. But Pilate is just as short-sighted as those people, thinking that if I give them what they want, then I'm out of it. Jesus is gone. They're gone. I'm, I'm done. I'm out of this. And I've appeased my wife. I, I, I stepped away from this righteous man. But just because he declares himself innocent doesn't mean he has, doesn't have to live with the consequences, which leads to our last question, introspective question here. What will you get if you get what you want? What will you get? And really, this, this is just trying to Think in the future a little bit. Think about consequences. Think about ramifications or implications to the exchanges we make on a daily basis. And and really, the, the easy application here in order to do this, as you assess, is simply just pause, just stop, which is not what we're taught in our culture. Our, our culture feeds off of our impulsive nature. I mean, now is the time. Anyway, th- this Christmas season, every advertiser is telling you, buy now, pay later. What does that mean? Indulge. Don't think about the consequences. Don't think about the monthly payments. No interest for 60 months. Then we pile it on later, you know? No they don't want you to think about those consequences. And that's why you've got to pause and step back, assess what will happen if I get what I want? What, what will those implications or, or, or ramifications, consequences be? Sometimes it doesn't always turn out the way that you think it will. You, you don't always, what you wish for is definitely not always what you need. And sometimes it doesn't turn out to be exactly what you want. I mean, these are the old adages that we've all heard and lived off of. The grass is not always greener. So let's not wish away today for what could be tomorrow when whatever the Lord has, maybe he's given us exactly what we need today and stop trying to exchange what we have now for what we wish could be. See, I think the bottom line for this as we apply this to our everyday lives is very simple. It's exchange the wrong things for the right things. Exchange the wrong things for the right things. Uh, In this passage, obviously, Jesus was the right thing, and they exchange the right thing for the wrong things, and they get the wrong things in, uh, in return. And those wrong things... Did they get a little bit of power? Sure, for a little while. Did they get a little bit of popularity? Sure, for a little while. Did they get some uh, immediate release, uh, you know, some, some immediate gratification? Sure, for a little while, but doesn't work out in the end. It never works out for us in the end when we trade the right thing for the wrong things. And that's why I think we've got to understand, we've got to trade the wrong things to receive the right thing because there are exchanges that God is okay with. See, there's one person in this passage who it works out well for. You know who that is, right? It's Barabbas. He's the one person it works out well for. Because Barabbas' story was he was a murderer, put on trial, convicted, guilty, and condemned to death. And Jesus steps in and says, I'll take his place. I'll exchange my life for his. You see, ironically, the person that it works out for here is the most unrighteous person in the whole story. And that's our story, is that even though we were convicted and condemned because of our own sin, Jesus said, I'll exchange my life for yours. I'll I'll take your place. See, Jesus could have stopped this whole thing. We all know that. And instead, he chose to say, no, it's okay. I'll let Barabbas go free, and I'll take his place. See, one of the things that what Barabbas means, his name, it means son of the father. And so what you have here is an exchange of sons of the father. You have Jesus, the true son of the father, Father God, taking the place of a convicted murderer so that he could become a son of the father. That should be our story. 
salvifically that you allow Jesus to take your place to pay the penalty for your sins. But don't let it stop there. In the season of wishing and wanting, there are many of other exchanges that Jesus is okay with. He's okay if you exchange your sorrow for joy. He's okay if you exchange your bitterness for forgiveness. He's okay if you exchange your discontentment for his contentment and peace. He's okay with those exchanges. So this, this season, this Christmas season, as you build those lists and think about what you wish could be and what I wouldn't give for, and you think about those exchanges, think about making the exchanges that God is okay with, exchanging the wrong things for the right things. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you took our place. When you died on the cross, I don't, I don't think I would have made that exchange, and that's why we praise you, because you are God and we are not. And I thank you that you don't just make that exchange for us one time, but you continue to sit beside us and say, what else do you want to exchange? Give it to me, and I'll give you something better. So Lord God, would we not hold on to the wrong things and open our hands so that you would give us the right things. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Cody. I can't think of a better way to um, continue in worship after that sermon by us as a family sharing uh, the Lord's Supper together. You know, I love that second question that, uh, that Cody asked. He said, it says, who wants, uh, who wants you to want what you want? And what we know about the Lord's Supper is that it really answers that question in the sense that God wants us to want Him. We know that to be true because He gave Himself in exchange uh, for us. He desired for us to want Him, and He created a path that that can become possible through this through this exchange. Uh, What's interesting is when Paul talks about um, uh, this in, in the book of Corinthians, he says. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, that was, it was the worst night of his life, and yet he was thinking about you, and he was thinking about me, and he was giving us this symbol of what that exchange would look like. That is, we would exchange our sinfulness for his righteousness, and he would take our sinfulness upon himself. You know, if that's something that you've embraced in your life, uh, I would encourage us all just to celebrate that together in the Lord's Supper. If you haven't quite got there yet, I want to encourage you, today is the day. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and share in this communion meal together with us. If you haven't quite got there yet, I just ask that you would refrain as we continue in this worship. Now, with that, uh, Paul did tell us, and if you'll have your communion elements ready, he told us that on the night that he was betrayed, that Jesus took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray. Father, we are, we are so grateful for what you've done for us in this exchange I think as Cody mentioned, we recognize in ourselves that the spirit of Barabbas does live in us, or it did live in us. And yet you didn't leave us in the state that we were in, but you exchanged your life for our life, uh, our guilt for your righteousness so that we can know you and love you. Lord, I just pray that that spirit transcends this season for us, and that as a family, as we've celebrated this communion together, that we would continue to worship you in everything we do. In your son's name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. As we close in worship, would you stand? We'll sing together. Aren't you so glad for the gift of Jesus, our Savior? Let's sing together. Say
Continue to direct our praise to him by singing this. Thank you, Josh. Uh, If you're joining us online, thanks so much for doing so. Uh, Please stick around. Owen's got some things to say to you. And if you're a guest here in the sanctuary, thank you so much for choosing to spend a part of your weekend with us. We'd love to get to know you more. Best way to do that is to go out into the great room. You'll see a screen that looks just like that and uh, a pastor that can answer any questions that you might have about our church. We'd love to begin to walk with you. It's a wonderful community, wonderful people who love the Lord, love his word. Uh, Also, if you're here and you need prayer for anything, I know this can be a very, very heavy time. Uh, Please don't carry those heavy burdens alone, and please do not carry those heavy burdens out of here. Uh, Let's leave them here with the Lord, and we'd love to be able to do so through prayer. So if you need prayer for anything, we'll have some folks that would love to be able to pray. Okay, also getting ready for Christmas Eve, please go online and get those reservation reminders. We have those cards for you. And if it means no difference to you or your plans, what I would ask is, would you go to one of the outside hours, meaning we'll have four traditional worship experiences here, uh, 133, 430, and 6. Uh, obviously, during those middle hours, that's when we're going to host a lot of guests. Would you consider coming at 130 or 6? That would be helpful for them. But these reservation reminders for you and anyone who's coming, make sure that you have a seat and you have a parking place. And so we want to give you the best worship experience as well as our guests. And then for everyone on that same website, uh, you can find all the information you need for Christmas Day. Remember, uh, we are not meeting in person on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, we are going home with you. And so we've got a gift for you that you can sign up for on that website so you can have it uh, delivered right to you uh, on Christmas Day. And so uh, please do that. Please do so so that you are prepared for all things Christmas so that on Christmas morning you get to wake up and see our smiling faces uh, in your living room or wherever you may be. But uh, this is a great time. Uh, Love you, church. I'm really excited about uh, what God has in store for us as a Fort Worth campus. But this next week, just remember... Exchange the wrong things for the right things. Amen? God bless you. We love you. See you. I'm glad you joined in today. I hope you have a great week until we're back together again for our last Sunday in Matthew, at least for right now. Remember to let us know how we can best pray for you today and throughout the week before you head into the rest of Sunday. And during the week, you can use that info you'll see right after this to reach out to me if anything comes up. We're now less than two weeks away from our Christmas Eve services. And remember to make your plans to join in if you already haven't. We have services across all of our venues. And just to make sure we have enough space for everyone, we ask that you let us know if you'll be attending in person by reserving that time on our website. A link to that's in the chat right now. It's going to be a great celebration of Jesus, and we're excited to join with you in that. We've enjoyed sharing in these moments with you and look forward to the moments when we're together again as we wrap up Matthew next Sunday. Thanks for being a part today. We'll see you then.